Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 154 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Michael Carlfelt, and the topic of the show is cutting-edge integrative medicine tools. Dr. Michael Carlfelt is a board-certified naturopath with expertise in a wide variety of naturopathic modalities and healing practices. His fascination with naturopathy began at an early age when he met Dr. Ingemar Weiberg, a leading Swedish naturopathic doctor in Switzerland, when he was 13 years old. After studying engineering for two years, he worked with Dr. Weiberg for seven years in a demanding, rigorous, and carefully supervised apprenticeship. It was this work that opened his eyes to the world of natural healing. Dr. Carlfeld currently practices at the Carlfeld Center in Meridian, Idaho, where he works with patients using numerous healing tools, including IV therapy, applied psychoneurobiology, oxidative medicine, naturopathic oncology, neural therapy, sports performance, energy medicine, natural medicine, nutritional therapies, aromatherapy, auriculotherapy, reflexology, autonomic response testing, anti-aging medicine, and more. His passion to promote natural health publicly has led Dr. Carlfeld to being a sought-after lecturer, writer, and professor. His current endeavors include hosting the popular TV show True Health with Dr. Carlfeld, available on Amazon Prime, and the Health Made radio show and podcast. Tens of thousands of patients have sought his naturopathic expertise in his clinic in the more than 30 years that Dr. Carlfeld has been practicing. Dr. Carlfeld believes in the innate intelligence and healing power of the body, and if properly supported spiritually, emotionally, and nutritionally, it can find its way back to health. And now, my interview with Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I am super excited today to have Dr. Michael Carlfeld on the show to talk with us about cutting edge tools in integrative medicine. For me, this conversation feels a bit more like going to Toys R Us, and I'm so excited today to have this conversation. Thanks for being here, Dr. Carlfeld. I'm really excited. It's going to be really cool to get to share some of the, the amazing things that, the, that are available that people just don't know about. Tell us about your personal path that led you to becoming a doctor, to doing the work you do today, working with people with complex chronic illnesses. So, so it was fascinating. I actually started in engineering. Yeah, I, I wanted to become a, 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 reach, a research scientist ending up at Stanford uh, uh, at the electronic accelerator, uh, just trying to figure out the universe and uh, so that, that was my initial passion. And uh, a dear friend of mine, he was like a father figure uh, to me. He's a naturopathic doctor in, in Sweden. He uh, is one of the leading ones in Sweden, also headed up one of the curriculums there for uh, one of the uh, natural schools that we, natural healing schools that we had in Sweden. And uh, he, he said, well, why, why don't you just come and check what I do out and see, see what you think? And so I hung out with him for a little bit, and I and I really loved the impact that he had in people's lives. And uh, so it was, I was a little torn going back and forth, you know, thinking because I, I like complex issues, uh, and I, I figured if I solved the universe, you know, that that should be complex enough. Um, but uh, but as I was thinking about it, you know, sitting in a in a you know lab and, and trying to figure out or doing math equations all the time. Yeah, you know, physics. You know that it was really intriguing to me, but I I figured out to work with the human being and the complexities and all the different interactions of what takes place in a human being. I mean, to me, that would be even more intriguing and actually be uh, much more rewarding. And then also then getting that 
that direct result where you can see the impact in people's lives as you are working on them. Yeah, and and so I and, and that's what made me shift. Yeah, I started to study with him, study underneath him, and and uh, I've been now that was back in 1987, and I've been go- going strong ever since. Beautiful. Let's start by talking about one of our mutual passions, which is autonomic response testing created by our mentor, Dr. Dietrich Klinghart. How do you use ART in your practice? Is it something you use with nearly every patient? How often do you find that the information that you obtain from a tool like ART brings you new insights that maybe would otherwise be difficult to acquire with conventional testing alone? See, the, the, what is amazing is that the body is such a complex piece of machinery and the, the sum total of all these activities, uh, it is really hard to measure, to look in the blood, to see what, what's going on there and get a good picture of what, what truly is happening or you know, checking what's coming out of the urine and, uh, or you know, whatever type of measurements that you have uh, looking at tissue. So if you want to gain more information, you want to get to more to where the body communicates. And, and there you have the, uh, the nervous system, the electrical system uh, that is then also directly correlated to all the different activities of the body, all the, the, the tissues, the organs, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, endocrine system. So if you can then go beyond just looking at the blood and seeing uh, what the sum total of what's going on in the body through the autonomic nervous system, it's a, such a much better way to gain access as to what's going on. So I, I use it with all my patients. Uh, it, it is something that I feel I would not be able to do without. I feel that medicine without that type of testing is very crude. Uh, blood is a very late stage testing. Uh, so if you want to see what is going on before that, you, you need to utilize tools like autonomic response testing. And, uh, and I've done a number of other type of so-called muscle testing techniques in the past. And I feel that the autonomic response testing uh, has really kind of eliminated a lot of caveats that exist within the, uh, uh, the muscle testing. So with that, you know, let's say you, you have a patient coming in and, and the body only has so many different ways to communicate as to uh, how it's feeling. I mean, that, that, it's, that something is wrong. It's kind of like the car in a dashboard. You, know, you, you have a light you know, saying warning light and, and that's it. So now you have to figure out you know, what, why is the warning light on? Why is that red light on? And it's the same with the body. It only communicates in a few ways, you know, like your energy is low or you have pain or you feel depressed or... Uh, yeah, so th- those are some of the, the most of the symptoms that you have relates to that. But then how do you find out what is causing that? You know, that can be uh, the countless amount of different things. So to be able to then access the intelligence of the body directly, you know, through a tool that uh, like autonomic response testing becomes, uh, it's phenomenal, you know, to be able to gain access to, you know, where you, you have all that knowledge and let the body communicate directly to you as to what's going on. And, and also when you're dealing with a disease picture, you're wondering, you know, which one, you know, so I have all these things going on with the individual. Maybe they deal with parasites or heavy metals or, you know, a thyroid issue or gut issue. You know, which one should I do first? Uh, and, and the body does best if you do things in an appropriate sequence. You don't want to do everything all at once. And with the autonomic response testing we're doing, you can actually kind of create the sequence that the body is ready for and ready to do. Uh, it's kind of liken it kind of like opening a safe. You know, you, you, you got to have the, the right number at the right time. Otherwise, the safe doesn't open. You know, so, and that's what happens when you use the autonomic response testing is that you are able to tap in and see, you know, what is the next thing that, that needs to be done? What, and I'm, I'm killing pathogens right now. Yeah, do I need to bind more or do I need to open up detox pathways? Do I need to open up the lymphatic? Yeah, maybe there's a nutritional deficiency that is making the body crash you know, when I'm going after these pathogens. So 
And um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't know what I would do without it. <laughs> I agree with everything you said. Sadly for me, I don't have the cool accent that you and Dr. Klinghardt have. When you explain it, it sounds even cooler than when I explain it, but totally agree. I mean, even in my own personal healing journey and recovery from Lyme and mold and so on, I mean, the practitioners that I've worked with since 2006 have always used autonomic response testing. And so uh, for me, I agree, it's just such a enlightening, insight producing tool. And I don't know how I would navigate this journey without it. If we extend a little further into the Klinghart realm and talk about applied psychoneurobiology or APN, which you also do, that is another technique that Dr. Klinghart developed to facilitate the release of trauma. And so I'm interested in hearing you talk a little bit about trauma and how that maybe is like a, a background process on our phones. And then how do you see trauma playing in terms of, is it commonly a primary issue that you see in your patients with complex chronic illness? So and then with Dr. Klingart, he talks about this uh, kind of levels of healing. And uh, he, he always, you know, so it's kind of like a pyramid where you have the physical and the bottom of the pyramid. And on the top of the pyramid, you have you know, your spiritual connection to God. So it's, it's almost like the tree of life where you, you look at the process uh, in, the, uh, in the Kabbalah. You, know, you, you have what's called the tree of life. And you start with uh, kind of your connection to God. And then you uh, end then with on the bottom, which you know, stands for Malkut, you know, which is kind of more the physical aspect. Uh, I, I feel that there, and in that, in the tree of life, and I also think in same with the pyramid with Dr. Klinghart, is that there's a continual energy going back and forth. You know, so it's not always that it's a, a direct process that you have to start this location, you know, this area, and then move in, in towards this end goal. Uh, I, I think that they somehow in, in the fiscal, there's a lot of spiritual, and in the spiritual, there's a lot of fiscal. So it's hard to separate both. So you have to look upon it as a whole instead of just separating them as different entities. And especially if we know in physics, uh, the uh, uh, matter is not really matter. We know that it's just frequencies anyway. You know, it's just a certain type of frequencies. So knowing that and then also knowing that the, the emotional traumas, you know, the impact that it can have on us, and how it then correlate to disease. You know, for instance, I do a lot of integrative oncology and also deal with other complex health issues, you know, like Lyme and, and chronic infectious agents, autoimmune, et cetera. And so then you can't just focus on the, uh, like the heavy metal, let's say I, I, you know, silver fillings and I have lupus, you know, so yes, I need to remove the, the heavy metals, but you also need to look at yeah, the, the trauma that, that might be driving that disease. And that may not be only what happens in your life per se. It can be something that happened you know, a generation prior, two generations prior, three. You know, in, in fact, after World War II, uh, the, uh, the, in, the, in the Jewish uh, concentration camps, you know, the uh, uh, people that were there yeah, you, they saw that three generations after people are living now are then experiencing the same kind of anxiety, same kind of trauma as if they lived in a concentration camp, which means that that trauma somehow gets stored in our physical being in our body, which means that let's say you have kidney disease, there may be then a, a trauma that may be triggering that kidney disease. And I look at it kind of let's let's see you're you're working with Lyme to clear out Lyme and they tend to settle you know the pathogens tend to settle in weak areas or I call it kind of a low gravity point so if you hold them trauma in certain areas that becomes in a low gravity point a weak area and what they've seen is that by holding stress in that area there's less circulation that goes into that organ and it just kind of a little bit less than what that happens is that there's less nutrients that gets to it. There's less uh, toxins that are able to be eliminated from it. So over time, you know, that organ starts to wear down physically and that becomes a habitat then for different pathogens. So, uh, or if you're dealing with cancer, it becomes in an area that, uh, that tissue can easily become abnormal. Uh, because of the, the human, that there's less defense in that area. So you can't just isolate your 
emotional components or uh, your, 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 your mental aspect and think that that is separate from your disease. It always goes along with your disease. So APN, uh, which stands for the Applied Secondary Biology, is then a fantastic way then to pinpoint to see where the trauma is originating from. You know, where is it stored in the body? You know, what kind of emotions is it associated with? And then using very simple techniques like eye movements, color, you know, laser sweeps to help to uh, engage the whole being, engage the whole intelligence of the individual in order to be able to address that trauma. Because a lot of times when, when we are, you know, are hurt, we tend to isolate that and we want to block that off from the rest of the being because that that's a painful sore spot so and while we're protecting that the rest of the body feels okay but it gets to a point where the rest of the body can't compensate anymore so now we need to engage the intelligence of the whole individual and you can then use that simple laser sweep you know, we just use light in order to be able to pick up that frequency and move it across the being that that whole being's field so that the, the being in itself can engage and start to heal that trauma. Because uh, as a naturopathic doctor, we, we believe in that we do have the innate intelligence within ourselves and we do have all the, the powers that exist. We are the best doctors there, there are exist within us. And to be able to access that fully and to use that intelligence, that's when we can really drive true healing. And that happens as much as it does on a physical level, it happens on an emotional level as well. Beautiful. Gosh, I love the way that you said all of that. For people that are resonating with this conversation that we're having here, I wrote an article with Dr. Klinghart probably over a decade ago now called the Klinghart Axiom, A-X-I-O-M. And if you just Google Klinghart Axiom, uh, you'll find that article that goes into much more detail on the connections between emotions and toxicity and microbial overgrowths that Dr. Carl Felt was just talking about, even so much so that it's interesting that Dr. Klinghart has talked about attempting to detoxify someone from heavy metals with every imaginable tool and then doing an emotional intervention and seeing the highest levels of metals being excreted from the body that the lab had ever seen after doing emotional work. So there is a connection between these emotions and what the body then is maybe holding on to. And so to your point, it's all very much integrated. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. One point that I want to make is that you know, frequently what happens, you, you have then the emotion, the trauma has a certain frequency to itself, and it takes a lot of energy to hold that trauma. So what we do then is that we tend to invite pathogens or heavy metals or chemicals that match that frequency so that it then it's kind of like the pathogen in itself is assisting us in holding that trauma. But then when we release the trauma, there's no need for the pathogen to be there to hold that energy anymore. So then it can then be released, kind of like what, what you're talking about with the heavy metals. You have a couple of other tools in the evaluation realm that I wanted to talk about. And I'm wondering how you're using live blood cell microscopy to assess your patients. What are some of the insights that you gain from looking at the blood under a microscope? Yeah, so uh, it, it is really fascinating. I mean, obviously, there's a big distinction between healthy blood versus sick blood. You know, so if you take a little drop of, of an individual's blood and you put it on a slide and you magnify that you know, tens of thousands of times, you can then see how the red blood cells behave, uh, the, the form of them, uh, how they relate to each other. Are they sticking together? You can also see the, uh, the health of the cell wall membrane which will then also translate into the help of the cell wall membrane throughout the rest of the body. So it's, you know, obviously the, the blood is a very important component of the body. And if you're seeing uh, those changes and those damages within the blood on the red, you know, red uh, blood cells, you can then imagine that, you know, tissue that is not as important, what they look like. You know, so you can then uh, so you can look at the health then of the cell directly and then determine whether do I need to do more cell wall membrane support? Do I need to, uh, is there a lot of inflammation that's going on? The, 
you know, the cell, uh, the red blood cells are sticking together, not able to transport oxygen efficiently. So then you know that uh, tissue is oxygen starved. Uh, you can also uh, relate to that. Uh, there's a lot of free radical activity. You know, the, there's not enough antioxidants to help to kind of keep those cell wall membranes healthy. You can also see pathogens, you know, like for instance, Lyme, the spirochetes. Uh, if you give them enough time and, and manipulate the, uh, the red blood cells a little bit, you can then see them coming out. You know, so you can actually look at them and see, you know, there's a lot of parasites, a lot of, you know, fungus is that, you know, you're dealing with Lyme and you can actually watch that live. And I, I would say that that's probably one of the best ways to pinpoint whether an individual is dealing with Lyme or not, because it is, it is so hard to, uh, to get a positive test through normal means, you know, like Western blot. I mean, we do have better ways, you know, the hygienics, you know, they seem to do a really good job, but you're still going to have a lot of false negatives. So to look under the, the, the microscope, look at the blood directly, uh, you, you gain a huge amount of information. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I love, I mean, it's, it's a huge, um, it's a, such a valuable tool, you know, just the live blood cell. You mentioned free radicals. And so I know you also do an oxidative dried blood test. And I'm wondering if that's something that you do in office. What is that telling you about the patient's health status and what types of treatment interventions might those results then lead you to? So with the oxidative uh, dry blood, and it's actually is done in conjunction with the live blood cell analysis, you know, where we, uh, we take a, a drop and we let it dry on the slide. Actually, we, we do little dabs on the slide and we, we let, let that dry. And you can then see the, uh, yeah, the, again, there's a tremendous amount of information that you see in how the blood dries. You know, you, you want it to look like the cross-section, I tell my patient, look like a cross-section of a tree, you know, without any termite holes. You know, you want it to be kind of a tightly knit, you know, nice looking tissue. Uh, with without any kind of abnormalities. And if you have that, you know that the individual has good tissue strength, uh, is able to withstand uh, disease very much more easily. Uh, but then you have these where you, if you see there's just a lot of holes, there's a lot of, you know, it looks like a sieve. Uh, and then you know that individual, if you're dealing with cancer, for instance, there, there's a certain look almost that, you know, this, this looks like and you got cancer. And I've had it a, a, a number of times where I, I look at the dry blood and, and uh, it, it just does not look good. So I, I asked them then to go and, and do some medical tests and, and lo and behold, you know, they're dealing with some lymphoma, uh, non-Hodgkin's or, you know, that. so it, it really helps a lot. And also what you can do, depending on the patterns, you can then see, you know, are you dealing with adrenal stress? You know, are you dealing with leaky gut? Are you What's your vitamin C levels? You know, do you have heavy metal toxicity? You can see kind of like a dark ring around the blood drop. And then you, you see that, you know, there's a lot of heavy metals in, in the body. And because the, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's a tremendous amount of depending on where these different spots are, uh, you can then determine, you know, which, which area of the body and also what tissue. And, you know, so an uh, incredible tool and it's, it's so non-invasive inexpensive and gaining that amount of knowledge you know, from just that. All right. So now we're going to move on to aisle three at Toys R Us and talk about <laughs> detoxification, which is really my you know, primary interest is in detoxification and drainage. I think it's just so critical. So I'm interested in hearing a little bit about how you use tools like laser energetic detox or ionic foot baths or other tools that might improve our ability to excrete toxins from the body, which are often really at the core of many of these conditions. Yeah, obviously, uh, to try to drive a bunch of nutrients into a, a toxic environment is not going to be that beneficial. So it is important to make sure that you uh, create an environment where, you know, if you add minerals and vitamins and, you know, things that, you know, you, you don't want to waste your money on these good nutrients. So you want to be able to clean out that that uh, extracellular uh, space and also what's going on within the cell and, and support and your detox pathways, you know, your, your liver, kidneys, lungs, skin, colon. Yeah, you know, so you want to make sure that all of them are supported. So you, you mentioned the ionic foot bath, and I, I love ionic foot baths, you know, because 
Uh, one, I mean, you, you, you sit and, and then you have a uh, electrolytes within the water and then you have a charge that you run through that water. And that charge will then start to pull things like heavy metals and chemicals and, and uh, other toxins and into the water and even pathogens, you know, because they have a certain charge that is then drawn towards that. And you can actually see in the water, you can see you know, a, a lot of this gunk coming out, but it's not always as important what is in the water. What is more important is what's taking place several days past that. You know, and, and they've done studies on this where they collect the urine of individuals that done these ionic foot baths and they can see the elevation of glyphosate, so uh, mercury of aluminum, you know, so that it, it really kind of initiates the body's ability then to move these, these toxins out. So, so you wonder kind of how, how does it do that since we are not doing the foot bath anymore? But what it really does, the, the most powerful aspect of the ionic foot bath is what it does to the ionic channels you know, within the body. And that's where all the transportation takes place of nutrients and of heavy metals and chemicals. So it opens up these pathways of transportation so that the body has the ability to move these metals and chemicals out of the system. And that's why you're seeing it in your urine, but it also opens up your ability to transport nutrients to the appropriate locations. I mean, a lot of people, they think that just because I take a multi, you know, all these nutrients are just magically going to appear in, in the most appropriate place. But if the the pathways are blocked, it's not going to be able to move there. And, and that's where the, the ionic foot bath really helps along with the, the normal detoxification of these other components. And then uh, you're talking about LED or what stands for laser energetic detox. And, and it, it looks interesting because all you're doing is that you use a homeopathic vial of a substance, and that can be at any metal, any chemical, any bug, you know, uh, but it can also be nutrients, it can be uh, DNA material, it can be uh, parts of the Krebs cycle. So it, it can be anything. And all it is, is just an informational package that is being delivered to the body through a laser beam. You know, so you have that little vial in front of the laser beam, and that laser beam then sweeps across the individual. And so the, uh, the energetic, uh, kind of the energetic aspect of the individual then gains that information about what is in that vial and that creates and changes. So if we use, for instance, mercury, it will then, we will then create that as a focal point. So then the body will start to look for that energy, that mercury throughout the body and start to collect that and move that uh, more efficiently. And I, it, it's incredible the impact that such a simple therapy has, or if you would use it then for a pathogen, let's say an individual is dealing with Epstein-Barr virus. You know, so you can then do and these different viruses. They, they like to hang out because they don't want to, the immune system to see them. Uh, they they want to kind of do their flares and then they go into hiding again. So now you do that, that sweep with that, that laser beam, you know, that carries the frequency of the Epstein-Barr and, and then the body start to recognize how uh, that is what the frequency looks like. And, you know, where does that frequency exist? And so it, it's, it's kind of like giving the body the knowledge and the information that it needs in order to be able to address uh, what's going on in the body. And, and coupling that then with the ART becomes really powerful because then you can pinpoint and see which pathogen or which chemical or which heavy metal do we need to address at this point? And then using laser energetic detox uh, to be able to do that becomes, it becomes uh, it's, it's very, uh, let's say my, my math teacher always, when we had kind of a, had a, a, a big equation, we're able to bring it down to a very tiny equation. He said, well, that looks elegant. Yeah. So it's a very good, very elegant technique. I love that. And I think a lot of that laser energetic detox work originated with Dr. Lee Cowden, if I remember correctly. Um, I had the opportunity to take some of those courses many years ago and uh, certainly a powerful tool. Let's talk about oxidative therapies like ozone, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I personally am a huge fan of ozone. I've used it in many different forms in my own health journey. 
What are some of the common conditions where you as a practitioner might use ozone in a patient? And what has your observation been in terms of clinical improvement with ozone therapy? What are some of your favorite ways to introduce ozone into the body? I, mean, I, I, I do a lot of intravenous here, but it, it doesn't mean that that is sometimes the most practical all the time. Uh, so uh, ozone can be introduced in, in many different ways. I mean, obviously the intravenous, uh, you can do it uh, uh, through your ears. You can do it rectally. Uh, you can put bag on different areas and fill that bag and then treat it that way. You can do it vaginally. Uh, and all these areas are really powerful. In fact, uh, one of my interviews on a radio show called Health Made Radio, and I had the pleasure of interviewing you as well. Uh, interviewed Sylvia Menendez. You know, she is uh, one of the leading uh, researchers when it comes to ozone and, and ozone therapy. And, uh, and she was saying that, uh, and, and you have different ways, you have the 10 pass where you introduce a large amount of, of uh, ozone. You, know, you do that 10 times to really kind of saturate the body and have a huge impact. Uh, but she's saying that even doing the, the rectal insufflation, you know, introducing ozone rectally, you know, over time, that seems to have a very similar effect, you know, so even if you may not have access to a fancy clinic, you know, like what we do here or other clinics throughout the United States, uh, you can still uh, gain a lot of traction with whatever you're dealing with, you know, just through rectal insufflation or through the ears and, and so forth. So, um, ozone is such a multifaceted tool and, uh, I, mean, I, I use, I, mean, I, I would say I use it for everything. I mean, I, I have patients that just want energy and we, you know, that it, it boosts them up energy wise. I have patients that are dealing with uh, viral infections like Epstein Barr or herpes or come in with shingles all over. And uh, we, we do intravenous ozone with that. Uh, we have uh, cancer patients, you know, like for, and so I had a uh, cancer patient and all we did, you know, she was dealing with breast cancer and all we did was the, ozone and vitamin C and uh, her breast cancer was just shrinking away. And uh, so it, it, it is such a multifaceted tool. And th the reason is that it, it works, it, it kind of corrects the, the redox aspect of the individual. So because it balances that redox with, you know, where you oxidate and, and oxidation is when, you know, for instance, you want to oxidate the pathogen to kill it, or you want to oxidate the cancer cell to kill it. But then you, you need the antioxidant where you, the reduction aspect, where you need to kind of repair the tissue after you need to kind of, if you have uh, oxidation area, you need to be able to support that and also protect yourself from other oxidative elements like chemicals in our environment, you know, very oxidative and, and the drive kind of that, that cancer process because it destroys tissue. So you need that support and ozone helps in that area beautifully, even though it is oxidative in itself, it triggers all these antioxidant uh, productions, you know, and kind of, it also balances it. It's like a pH buffer. So it does, it's, it's just such a multifaceted tool. So if we only had that, if that was the only tool we had, we could probably take care of the majority of things. I'll be very honest and say that I've not been super excited personally about hyperbaric oxygen therapy in the chronic Lyme realm, in the mold illness realm. And yet I really respect a number of practitioners that do find hyperbaric oxygen to be helpful. So I'm wondering, what are some of the conditions where you find hyperbaric oxygen therapy really does make a difference? Is it a tool that works well in chronic Lyme disease? Do we have to be concerned if we have Babesia, for example, which maybe would benefit from the oxygen-rich environment? So talk to us about hyperbaric oxygen and, and whether or not you do use it or find it helpful in the realm of chronic Lyme disease. So I, I, I don't use it a whole lot in, in chronic Lyme. And I know there, like, like you mentioned, there are a lot of practitioners that do. Uh, obviously, like you mentioned, Babesia impacts the oxygenation of tissue. Uh, there's a concern that if you use hyperbaric along with uh, when you're dealing with Babesia, that you're actually activating other type of pathogens you know, throughout the body with 
uh, with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Having said that, uh, there are a number of doctors that are having great success using hyperbaric. And then you have other ones that say that they've, they've done 40, 60 plus sessions and there was no change. So it's just waste of time and waste of money. And, and that is something that I want to make sure that I respect, you know, when patients come to me, uh, I don't want to throw something at them that I don't feel is going to have, you know, that's going to be a game changer or that that's not going to move the needle. You know, there are a lot of nice things that we can do, but at the end of the day, you know, is the patient going to get better? Uh, so in, in regards, I mean, I, and I, I like you, I love hyperbaric oxygen therapy. You know, I have, you know, we do it here at, at my center and I combine it a lot, you know, especially with my cancer patients, I, I combine it a lot there. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about photodynamic therapy later on. And uh, I utilize it there quite a bit. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit later on about how, how it's impacting there, uh, you know, and that therapy. But the, the, the biggest thing is that you have people dealing with neurological issues, you have uh, a heart, uh, people dealing, you know, post heart attacks, post stroke, uh, dealing with MS, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, those type of patients, they, they truly benefit from it. Uh, you, the, it, it's medically, it's only, uh, you can only use it for diabetic wounds. I mean, that, that's the only time that the insurance will really cover it. And, uh, but you, what it does for a diabetic wound is what it does internally as well. You know, so it actually it heals that wound internally. So whatever it is that needs healing, regeneration, you know, it will stimulate that. It, it increases the uh, stem cell circulation by like eight times and also increases the oxygen concentration of tissue by like 20 times. So that that really turns on healing throughout the body so and also now when we're dealing with also a lot of respiratory issues you know that inflammation and 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 in, uh, in, in your lungs you know, to be able to do hyperbaric on a consistent basis will really help to heal lungs and, and and reduce that inflammation so anytime there's inflammation or where you're needing to uh, heal tissue post trauma or just post that the you know due to some disease function uh, hyperbaric is, I, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing what it does. So later has arrived and now we're going to talk about PDT <laughs> or photodynamic therapy. What are some of the primary goals of using PDT? Is it to kill a bug or to stimulate the immune system or to support detoxification or produce more ATP and support the mitochondria or regeneration or something else? Like where does it fit? What are some of the conditions where you use it? And is it used more in cancer or does it have broader application with many types of complex chronic conditions? So, so there's a distinction between PDT, which stands for photodynamic therapy and uh, photobiomodulation. And uh, photobiomodulation, that's when you, uh, it's more the supportive, regenerative, you know, where, where you heal uh, aspect of the body. Uh, the photodynamic therapy, that is when you are uh, going after cancer cells, you are going after pathogens, and you, uh, you, you, you kill things. So you have the, the, the regenerative aspect, you have the, the killing aspect. So with photodynamic therapy, what you do there is that you combine the, the light, you know, the, the photo, uh, with a photosensitizer that then attaches itself to the target. You know, and becomes like a, a beacon, you know, come, come and shine on me. And so, and you can use a number of different photo sensitizers. I mean, common ones, we, uh, I, I use a lot of ICG here, or methylene blue is another one that I use a lot. But you can also use natural agents like uh, curcumin, poly MBA, uh, St. John's word, chlorophyll, uh, all, all these, and even actually, uh, uh, chemo, you know, like 5-FU uh, is a, a strong photosensitizer as well. So you can actually uh, piggyback on some of the, the chemotherapy and use uh, light you know, in order to be able to enhance the effect then of, uh, of the chemo. So uh, 
if you look at it on the photobiomodulation aspect, I mean, you, you have uh, different types of colors. You know, so you, you have, uh, it used to be that we only had red. And now we were able then to use, you know, both uh, uh, ultraviolet, uh, blue, uh, green, yellow, red, and also infrared. So we gain the, uh, the effect of all these different colors. And each color has a different function within the body. So if we look just at the, the mitochondria, which is our energy factor within the cell, uh, which is what you know, helps to repair the tissue. I mean, it, the mitochondria controls pretty much the, the repair of your DNA and repair of, of the cell in itself. And also it gives you energy to be able to do things. And so within the mitochondria, you have you know, complex one through four, which is where kind of energy drives through these complexes, you know, so it's kind of like a, a pathway uh, that we, we need to move through in order to be able to, uh, at the end, have the full impact of what the mitochondria gives us. So if, let's say, we go through and we, you know, we are, have complex one is active, but complex two is dysfunctional, you know, we, we are still not getting any energy because not moving through appropriately. So if you then bring in light, you can then activate, you know, these are very light sensitive. They, uh, it's kind of how the structure of them, they're able to absorb a tremendous amount of light. And complex one, what they've seen is, is then absorbing a lot of the, you know, the ultraviolet and the blue aspect and complex three, uh, the yellow and the green and then complex four, the, the red and the infrared. So you can then turn on the mitochondria simply by using light. And just that by itself would then have a huge uh, impact on the, uh, uh, on the regenerative aspects. So you can use that for anti-aging uh, and just for, you know, and obviously energy that will help with detoxification, uh, will help with any, anything that the cell needs to do. Uh, and then we can look at other aspects of what these colors do. So, for instance, we know that both red, I mean, uh, ultraviolet and blue, they are fantastic at killing pathogens just by themselves. I mean, we, uh, we know that if we shine ultraviolet light, you know, then we can then kill things on surfaces. And, and that's used a lot in the industry in order to be able to control infectious agents you know, in, in certain areas. So if we have the ability to do that then intravenously, then we are then able to, as the blood passes by that, that optic uh, fiber that's inserted intravenously, we are then continually killing pathogens you know, that, that are moving through there. And then if we then combine that with, you know, in the photodynamic component, if we combine that with a photosensitizer that then tags these different pathogens. So as they are then passing by where that, op where that light is intravenously, they are then tagged and they absorb a huge amount of light and then boom, you know, they, they're oxidized and killed. So, uh, and with, so you can do that then the photodynamic component, the killing aspect, you can then do that both for uh, pathogens and also for cancer cells. You know, if you have like, for instance, circulating tumor cells, you know, that, that is a big issue. Obviously you don't want a lot of those because that means that, now we are in a place where we are risk for metastasis. And uh, uh, most people don't die from the original tumor, they die from the metastasis. So if we're able to tag these different circulating tumors with a photosensitizer and then go after them with the, uh, the light that is then associated with that photosensitizer, you're then able to kind of control that aspect in a better fashion. Uh, going back a little bit to the, the photo biomodulation aspect, I'm, I'm sorry for going on and on, but this is my passion. This, this, I mean, the, this tool is, is just so incredible. <laughs> so you, you, you have then the uh, photo biomodulation aspect. You look at the blue light. One of the things that it does is that it actually uh, detaches the nitric oxide and nitric oxide from the uh, uh, from the uh, lining of the blood vessels, which allows it then to be more available. And we know that nitric oxide is, is tremendous in anti-aging. It slows down the, the breakdown of the telomeres. Uh, it uh, has a vasodilator, so increases circulation. Uh, and so it, it's just all the different aspects that come along with nitric oxide 
uh, you gain access to just by uh, introducing uh, intravenous blue light. You know, so you, you can do that in addition to the killing aspect that we, that we discussed earlier. And then you have things like the green light is fantastic to support and the red blood cells and help of the red blood cells. So if you look at the, uh, we talk about the live blood cell analysis and we saw that the, the red blood cells are all deformed and they are not able to do their job. You know, they're not able to transport oxygen. They're just pretty much there in the blood for show. And that's it. You know, it's uh, uh, like, a, like a bodybuilder that just looks big, but it can't do anything. Uh, so it's, it's the same same thing with these red blood cells that if we can then support them uh, with the green light and then that we can really kind of gain so, yeah, support the health of that uh, of that red blood uh, cell and uh, so it's fantastic for any kind of cardiac circulatory and then we have the yellow light you know for uh, dealing it's also very antiviral to combine that with St. John's wort which would be the photosensitizer that's extremely antiviral and uh, yeah, so it, they, they do each light does specific things uh, that is very, uh, very therapeutic for the body. And uh, I think that light, using things like light, uh, water, oxygen, you know, those are kind of the forefront of, of health and therapies because they are so benign, but they are yet so powerful. So um, yeah, it's, it's a tool that I love in, in my practice, and I, I use it for uh, all infectious agents and cancer patients and just for anti-age. I imagine that after you insert the cable that you say, may the force be with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A little Luke Skywalker in there. <laughs> One of the things that as I was uh, reading about the different colors, I noticed that red could potentially also help to support those dealing with hypercoagulation. Uh, I personally have always tended towards hypercoagulation. We know that things like mold exposure or babesia or heavy metals or many things can cause this hyper viscosity, hypercoagulation, thickness of the blood. I'm wondering if you use the photodynamic therapy to specifically address the hypercoagulation? Does it last for a reasonable period of time or is it something where they would have to do a number of sessions? And over time, do you see it being corrective in terms of the hypercoagulation issue? Yeah, so the hypercoagulation is kind of a uh, protective measure that the uh, the pathogens use. You know, so they 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 like to trigger, you know, secrete chemicals that then makes the red blood cells to kind of clump up, which uh, makes it so that that the blood moves slower. They have an easier time to pick up nutrients, you know, within the blood, and also white blood cells have a harder time to to get at them. So. You can use some the, the intravenous red laser light in order to be able to have that impact and, and it, and it will create that for a period of time, but you still need to address the, the cause of the hypercoagulation. So you need to work on both at the same time. So if you uh, just use the red and address the hypercoagulation, that way you'll, you'll get some back. And, uh, but you need to combine that with other therapies at the same time. You know, so, um, and the beauty though with red is that it also helps activate a lot of the, it really gives energy to the immune system, to the white blood cells. So in addition to then opening up the flow, it makes the white blood cells more active. So then they have more access and to these pathogens. So it, you, you have a little bit of that benefit as, as well. Is there a color photosensitizer combination that seems to work in Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia? What are some of the microbial overgrowths where you think of PDT as a primary tool? Yeah, so I, I would, in, in all of those, actually, you, you would use the, the, uh, uh, the ultraviolet and the blue spectrum tends to be kind of the, the stronger ones. Uh, for the, the viral and the yellow, uh, it it's also plays a huge role in itself. So with that, you use things like intravenously EGCG uh, or you know, things like curcumin, riboflavin, methylene blue. Uh, methylene blue, you, you, you do combine that with the red, uh, but uh, you know, the other ones you would combine with ultraviolet and, and, and blue. You know, so 
uh, yeah, they, they've been very effective in, in doing, yeah, and going after that, but it, it doesn't become just a soul therapy. You, you, you do need to combine it with other aspects and that's where you bring in like APM to make sure that you do your, your open up your detox pathways and also support endocrine wise. You know, if you get genetic SNPs, you know, look at that. So you, you, you still want to look at the, the whole individual because there are people that just do that as a monotherapy and, and you'll get, gain a lot of traction. But if you don't address the rest, you're, you're only going to go so far. How long is a traditional PDT session? And then how much of the blood can we actually treat in a single session? See, that, that's the beauty of it when you are, uh, we're used to UBI, you know, that, that's some UBI stands for ultraviolet blood irradiation. So that's something that's been around for a very long time. And uh, I use it still because, you know, people want it and they like it and, and I see great results. So then that I'm not going to stop. But there you have then where you pull 60 cc of an individual's blood and you, you know, put that in a saline bag and, and then you put ozone into that and you run that through a, a machine where you radiate that component of, of the ultraviolet of, you know, component of the blood. So that's 60 cc that you are then irradiating. If we use and the you know, like uh, and the intravenous laser, you know, machine that we, we use as a Weber laser, uh, and uh, you're actually treating the blood as it's passing by. So what you're doing is that you're creating a, a sterile environment, you know, because it is within your own circulation. You know, so the blood never leaves your body. It's not going through some machine that's filtering it. You know, it's not being put in a bag. You know, it, it's a completely sterile environment within the bloodstream. And as the blood is passing by, it's being treated, which means that, you know, every time, you know, if the, the blood it does a complete circulation, I believe it takes about a minute, you know, for the body to move uh, throughout the whole body. So if you do a therapy, and usually a session lasts about an hour and you do several colors, you know, do 15 minutes of, of each color. In some instances, we do a little bit longer depending on, uh, but in an hour's time, you're then able to treat your whole blood circulation 60 times. You know, so here you're comparing 60 cc of your blood versus your whole blood circulation, whether that is, uh, was that like almost six quarts of, of blood? You know, so you're, you're treating that 60 times. So uh, six times 60, 360 times. Uh, <laughs> wow. that, yeah. Yeah. So it's a huge, <laughs> huge amount of impact for that. So similar to the conversation we were having earlier, where you talked about IV ozone, but also being able to do, let's say, insufflation. Some people work with their practitioner to learn how to do that at home. They do it consistently over a long period of time, and that has cumulative benefits. I know that the Weber medical laser people also make a wearable device that people can wear at home and can be programmed to do different things. And so I'm wondering, do you find that that wearable or portable device also has significant clinical benefit? Yes, they've actually done studies uh, on that. I mean, especially now with the, the, the COVID era that, that we're in, uh, they had uh, 100 people that they treated uh, using then this wearable device. And it had an attachment where you also treated both you know, intranasally and then also uh, your, your, your tonsils, you know, uh, treating kind of in, in, your, in, in your throat. And uh, they combined that with a photosensitizer. And the ones that they used in the study that they did was a riboflavin, which is just a vitamin B2, you know, which is a just a water soluble vitamin. So it's very safe. You can do that in high doses with, without any damage in any shape or form. So they combined that with this wearable device and they were able to take 100 of 100 from testing positive to testing negative, you know, after doing the treatment, which, which is quite phenomenal. So I, I use it quite frequently for people that are dealing with any kind of chronic issues. You know, I, my cancer patients, I want them to have one because they come here and they, they do the treatment and they get this boost, but I want that boost to continue. And uh, so it, it is a watch that you, you're pretty much just kind of wearing on your wrist 
and you, you turn it so that the light kind of hits the blood right here. You get, it's a very, the blood is very close to the surface right here. So you're continually treating the blood uh, as it's passing by. And then if you've taken a photosensitizer prior to, uh, like riboflavin or curcumin or uh, some uh, chlorophyll type of uh, supplement uh, or methylene blue, you know, which I use a lot of, uh, then that will then improve then the effect in clearing out these pathogens. So it gives a boost then to the immune system increases circulation. You're talking about the hypercoagulation. If you do this on a consistent basis, you're consistently uh, coaching uh, the blood to, to flow smoothly. And we, we know a lot of the chronic diseases are, uh, are connected to uh, the hypercoagulation. We don't get that, that good flow uh, to all the cells so that they get all the nutrients that they need. And so we can transport all the toxins from them. So uh, it's it's a very very powerful device, uh, and I highly yeah. If any anyone wants them, we we have them. There are plenty of other clinics that carry them, uh, but it's it's just like the the ozone devices. I think that's a fantastic home tool to use and and to have. So is that tool is that something then someone would have to physically come to your office and have an appointment, or is that something that they could if they were interested in the wearable device that they could work with your team remotely to be able to acquire that? Uh, absolutely, yeah, it's something that anyone in the world can can get, uh, and it's just to, to let us know. Uh, cool. And uh, yeah, it's it's a home device that's fantastic. I think that everyone should have. We have one here in the clinic, one at home, and. I, I, I wear them all the time. One of the challenges I think with chronic Lyme and mold illness is, you know, these conditions go on for years and decades in some cases. And even once you've addressed the microbial piece and the toxicity, there is some degree of damage that's happened where we really need some restorative tools and reparative regenerative tools supporting the collagen, those types of things. And I'm wondering, can PDT be helpful for activating the production of our own stem cells? And can we use these light and photon therapies then to support that regeneration and repair process? Uh, absolutely. I mean, they, they've seen that using intravenous light, you know, intravenous laser light, it, it actually increases the uh, stem cell activity by 20 times, uh, so which means that you're, you're really speeding up the regeneration of the tissue. And I, and I see, you know, I also do podcast integrative Lyme solutions with uh, uh, Dr. Carl Felt, where, uh, where I had you on telling your amazing journey and, and your top 11 that, that you, you'd like for a person to go through when, when you're dealing with Lyme. So a lot of people, they get so hyper-focused because they just go after the bug and they just kill the bug. They, they, uh, they, they, and I see that with patients all the time is that they, they get so bug-focused and they just kind of move from one uh, killer to another killer. And then now it's parasites and now it's mold and now it's Babesia and now it's Bartonella. And now it's, you know, so just, it gets so hyper-focused on whatever the bug is. Uh, not recognizing that these uh, pathogens that live in an environment and uh, that environment becomes really crucial in regards to how these pathogens behave. And so you, you need to have a strong environment and you need to regenerate that environment. And that's where things like uh, photo, you know, photobiomodulation becomes really important. Uh, also then obviously nutritional agents along with that. Uh, I do uh, a lot of other therapies as well. You know, we, we sometimes do you know, like stem cell for regeneration. Uh, we don't use it really for uh, kill other things. I mean, it's mostly when, when you have the body in a, a certain state where stem cells can really do a good job, you know, where you know, the environment is right, then that is appropriate to, to utilize things like that. So um, yeah, absolutely. And, and then I may throw in hyperbaric oxygen therapy at that time, you know, not, not to go after the bug, but then to actually to regenerate. I think that's a really good point about stem cell therapies. I did stem cell therapy probably 13 years or so ago in Panama. I did not find it helpful personally in any obvious or significant way. 
Uh, maybe if I had gone back and done several more, I would I would have seen other benefits. But my observation in the chronic Lyme and mold illness in that arena of chronic illnesses is that people oftentimes get really excited about jumping to stem cells and then find out, wow, it was really something more foundational, like I was still living in a moldy house, or I had some other, you know, not enough detox or drainage support or something like that. And so wondering what your thoughts are, I mean, do you find stem cell therapies helpful for chronic Lyme disease and more systemic issues? Or is it better for more targeted issues and later in the healing process? I would say later in the issue. And, and the issue with stem cell, I, I think that people they, it, it is sexy. I mean, you, you like the idea of something that's able to build any kind of tissue, you know, in your body. You know, so, so if you have damage anywhere, you know, how cool to just get little guys in that can become that tissue and heal that tissue. And then also, you know, stem cells, they secrete a, a, a soup of growth factors, depending on what, what kind of area that they're drawn to. But, uh, and just to kind of expand on, on the point we're making is that uh, stem cells can only do as well as in the environment that it is in. So if you have a toxic environment, if you have a lot of infectious agents, if you have all these different things, the stem cells are not going to be able to overpower that. You know, they're, they're not superhumans in that way. But if you are doing the foundational components, uh, then stem cells becomes a, a beautiful tool. You know, if you, you, and, and you need the nutrients, I, I always, I mean, uh, stem cells require you know, all these different nutrients. So just to uh, kind of do stem cells by themselves but not supplying the, uh, the cofactors and the building blocks and all the different aspects that uh, the stem cells need in order to be able to get to work, it doesn't make any sense. You know, so it's, it's kind of like have, workers come out to a construction site, but you have no tools, you have no building material. So they're just standing there not being able to do anything. So you need to supply what the stem cells need. So in your case, I'm going to Panama, Panama. I mean, maybe at this point where you're at now, you would have a different impact. Agree. But uh, yeah. And, uh, but I, I see, I'm going to have patients coming in, they're dealing with ALS and they, you know, but I look at what's going on in the body and they're, you know, heavy metal load is tremendous and they have these small toxins in them and, and they just say, well, I want stem cells, you know, because I, I, I saw somebody that got stem cells and they got better. And, uh, and, and I warn them and say, if we don't do this foundational, you know, we're, we're not, it's going to be a lot of money for nothing. And uh, they push for it anyway, and, and then they get a lot of money for nothing. And <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, I, I, I have had, you know, like for instance, an elderly lady, you know, stage five kidney disease, and you do uh, combine stem cells with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, with intravenous laser therapy, uh, with nutritional IVs, and uh, it, it turns it around. Yeah, uh, it's uh, and she was supposed to. She didn't want to go on dialysis. She was elderly, and then she you know, didn't want to have to deal with dialysis all the time. So she said, "I'll, I'll give this a shot." You know, they, I was told I'm going to die in about one to two months if I don't do anything. And uh, so she she came to my clinic, and and we did exactly that. You know, we we did these all these therapies in combination with stem cells, not just by itself. And uh, we were able to have that impact. You know, and uh, She's doing great now. Her kidney numbers are, are I mean, it's, it's looking great. I mean, it's not perfect, not 100% at GFR, but uh, it's, you know, it's a solid almost 50, you know, which wow. she, you know, she's doing great. Let's talk about another one of the exciting tools that you use in your office, which is platelet-derived nanomedicine. And so my understanding is that this is a tool that you use in cancer, in autoimmune conditions, also in regenerative medicine as well. So talk to us about this platelet-derived nanomedicine and how does this tie into the photodynamic therapy? So the, the, the platelet nanomedicine is, is something that has been researched quite a bit. And, and what that uh, nano just means tiny, obviously, and that allows when a particle is small, it's able to move to locations that it otherwise would not be able to if it wasn't that small. So if you are able, and then you look at platelets, you know, the platelets in themselves, they contain uh, a, a huge amount of uh, a, a kind of growth factors and, and stimulating agents, regenerative aspects. 
and they are drawn towards areas of inflammation. And inflammation is usually where injury is taking place, you know, where healing needs to, uh, uh, to be produced. Or if you're dealing with cancer, you know, cancer is in a very inflammatory condition. So you, you, you know, they, they're driven towards where inflammation is, and the same with stem cells. So what we do, if you are able then to nonanize, you know, to take, the, take these platelets and you go through a, a process where you use an ultrasonic device and then you do a microfiltration, you're able then to create these small, tiny little vesicles that are then drawn towards these areas that needs help. and so. The beauty with this is that you can then, in regards to these platelet-derived you know, nanoparticles, you can then load them with medicine. You can load them with whatever it is that you want to be offloaded into the area that you want it to go to. So, for instance, if you're dealing with cancer, then you want to have agents that then triggers more oxidation within the cancer. And if you then combine it with photodynamic therapy, then you are then able to then be photosensitized or package them within these nanovesicles that uh, almost like exosome like structure. And they are then driven towards where the cancer is and, and then offloading then these photosensitizers more efficiently within the cancer so that you are can be much more effective and creating a, a oxidative stress and killing off the cancer cells. Uh, but then also if you, for tissue healing, you know, let's say you have a joint issue and you, you know, usually you can do like PRP, you know, within the joint to, to trigger regeneration of, of uh, that joint space. And you can look at it at, you know, ultrasound, and you can see the, uh, the fibers, you know, the tendons, the ligaments start to kind of close up. If you then combine that also with uh, this process, the platelet derived and, and you can load them with like growth factors or peptides like BPC-157 or, or thymosin alpha-1 to really stimulate the regeneration, uh, it becomes a really uh, a dish powerful way to really make sure that you get these healing agents into the location. Or, you know, we're talking about Lyme disease, for instance, a, a patient, you know, that was bothered by, uh, you know, have a huge impact by uh, you know, human herpes virus six, you know, which can really have a neurological impact on the individual and, you know, healing, having these severe kind of neck tightness and pains and uh, that's, you know, it's causing the story, uh, making him not being able to think appropriately. So you're able then to load these, these nanoparticles with things like artisanate, you know, and then be able to, you know, put that into location uh, to, so that you can then go after the pathogens right there. And you could do the same with things like curcumin or EGCG or, you know, whatever agent it is that you would like. Uh, and so it becomes just a really powerful tool to transport whatever it is that you want to the area that needs it. You know, so uh, it's very kind of cutting edge technology. A couple of things come to mind. I mean, it sounds like a super powerful liposomal plus, plus, plus type of scenario. And also IPT or insulin potentiated therapy that's been used for many years in the cancer arena to reduce the blood sugar, to use a small amount then of chemotherapeutic agents to really target getting them into the cells. I mean, this kind of sounds like almost the next generation of IPT. Is that a reasonable way to think about this? It, it, it's very, you're very accurate. I mean, there, there's a number of studies that are using uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents like you know, doxorubicin, and they load them in these uh, nanoparticles and then uh, they are then driven towards, you know, because you have, again, that inflammatory signaling that's taking place within the cancer. It will then drive that towards the cancer cells and offload the doxorubicin to kill off the cancer so that you don't have doxorubicin floating around everywhere in the body. You're then getting it targeted to that area and having an impact right there and then. Yeah. So it, it, again, I'm it becomes a very elegant you know, tool to uh, uh, where you don't create all this collateral damage that you see. Uh, so it's very similar to the IPT, the insulation 
uh, insulin potentiation therapy, you know, where you don't need as much because you are maximizing uh, the the impact at the location where it's needed. Boy, you have quite the toy store there. A pretty impressive <laughs> toolbox. We're going to talk about the next tool is Hocket, which is an ozone sauna system. Stands for hyperthermic ozone carbonic acid transdermal technology, which probably for most of us doesn't really mean a whole lot. Um, I saw one of these systems at a conference at the time, and this is years ago, at the time, I wasn't super drawn to it. It seemed like it was so many different things that the body was kind of being asked to integrate at once. It seemed like a somewhat aggressive tool. And yet I'm really interested in your thoughts. Like what can it do? The 10 different technologies that it can deliver are those things that are used in every session, or do you use a subset of those technologies depending on that specific patient's needs? So the, uh, and, and you agree, I, I agree. It sounds like a lot, but it is, it's kind of like where you have, you know, one plus one doesn't equal two, you know, equals 10. And then one plus one plus one equals a hundred. So it, it can seem a little bit intimidating for an individual then that has a very sensitive system and that is dealing with a, you know, where, where they are hyper reactive to a, a lot of different things. Uh, what I've seen though is that, um, so the, the different therapies just kind of go through them. You have the, the carbonic acid, which, or carbon, uh, or you know, carbon dioxide. Uh, you have ozone, you have uh, the infrared, you have uh, a rife technology, which is an electrotherapy where you can then uh, use a specific frequency depending on what it is that you're dealing with. Uh, you also have photo uh, phototherapy. You, know, you actually have light that then kind of bounces around you know, within the, the hockey chamber and also the little droplets of water that's in there. They kind of create more reflection as well. Uh, you have hyperthermia that's going on. You have exercise with oxygen therapy. You have uh, uh, <laughs> temp you have uh also an ultra ultrasonic yeah i mean so all these things are going on at the same time usually the, the ones that you isolate away and uh, you i mean you can shut off certain things you you don't need to do hyperthermia if you're sensitive to it uh, the PEMF, you know that that you do kind of separate and the ultrasonic you can do that separate so you you can run these other therapies uh, but they are really powerful in themselves and you can regulate as to how much you do depending on how much time that you're spending with the uh, carbonic acid uh, and ozone and also the concentration of ozone that comes out so you you can kind of control if a person is very sensitive then you can dial down on all these different therapies but uh, yeah, it, it's fat. They, they work in conjunction beautifully. Like, for instance, you start with the carbonic acid, which is very, it's a good kind of buffer, pH buffer in itself. And then obviously you follow that with ozone. Like I talked about, it's a good redox uh, controller. So it just helps to put the body in, in a homeostasis, so to say. But the, the carbonic acid, it, it prepares the body for the ozone that comes after within the treatment. And uh, so it, it prepares the red blood cells to more efficiently be able to transport oxygen into the cells. Uh, it also uh, brings circulation more to the skin surface you know, where you can then more efficiently pull in the ozone that's within that, that chamber. Uh, looks like a little personalized sauna uh, where your, your head is sticking out and you're just sitting there in your birth, birth suit you know, to make sure you have uh, <laughs> you know, the, the best impact. Uh, but so, yeah, so the carbonic acid is actually key to the effectiveness of the ozone. So it just an ozone chamber, ozone sauna by itself would not even do close of what you do in combination of that. And then you uh, add then the photobiomodulation. We know that we have uh, little sensors along our, our skin that are like little antennas that actually pull in light continually. And uh, so we, we are then recharging. So it's, it's like you're hydrating the body. You're giving the body the, 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 the fire that it needs. Uh, we also, you know, through the, the hyperthermia, you're bringing in light because you know, most of us are light deficient. 
and also you're bringing in the oxygen. So it's, it's like you're, you're stimulating the, the basic or refueling the basic elements that the body needs in order to be healthy. And then also you work on the electrical system as well through the Rife technology. So it, it's like you're, you're, you're kind of activating all these aspects, aspects of the individual uh, that they need to be healthy and, and to be able to find homeostasis. So I, I use it a lot. I use it sometimes you know, with my cancer patients, I do, you know, hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy one day and then the hot kit another day, uh, just so I get the benefit of, of both, you know, because they uh, both have tremendous benefit, but they work in, in different ways. Um, I, so the patients that I use it for, I mean, it, it's a lot of times if they need detoxification, you know, I like to use this in combination with the ionic foot bath and the laser energetic detox. That seems to really kind of start to move heavy metals and chemicals out of the body. Or if you want to kind of recharge the immune system, uh, you know, the, the hocket along with some of the nutritional IVs uh, can really also kind of recharge the, the immune system tremendously. It, it really supports the body kill off, you know, pathogens and, uh, mold and all, all these different things. Uh, if you are looking at the regenerative aspect, then uh, combining that then with you know, things like uh, the, the PRP, you know, the, uh, the platelet derived you know, PRP is fantastic. And along with other nutritional agents that we do intravenously and orally and peptide therapy, you know, it, it becomes amazing. I think I'm going to have to plan a trip to Meridian, Idaho and come by and uh, visit your toy store. <laughs> we'll, we'll play. We'll have fun. <laughs> so you mentioned peptides, which is a great segue into the last tool that I wanted to touch on today. I've done some prior shows with Dr. Seeds and Dr. Holtorf. So listeners have some familiarity with BPC-157, with thymosin alpha-1, with thymosin beta-4, maybe even some of the newer tools like KPV. What are the peptides that you're seeing helping your patients the most? When do you use them? And is it more for immune modulation or more for restoration and regeneration or a combination of everything? So it, obviously peptides, I mean, there, there are thousands of different peptides and they all have different functions. They are just kind of a longer chains of amino acids that have these kind of signaling aspects to them. Uh, so they, and it's, it's kind of the, again, the forefront in where medicine is go and going to use these, these type of tools in order to be able to create changes within the body. Uh, so currently, especially with what's going on, you know, pandemic wise you know, in the world now, uh, one that I use quite frequently along with methylene blue. And the reason that I use methylene blue is because it's ability to kind of block spike proteins and also very antiviral and turn on the mitochondria and, and you know, does a lot of these things. But I, I use that in combination with thymus and alpha one. And, uh, and the reason for thymus and alpha one is, is really, it helps to kind of build up the immune system. It, it's very immunomodulatory. So uh, uh, for instance, if you need to, if you're dealing with cancer, it activates the immune system, go after the cancer. If you're dealing with autoimmune, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I mean, I've, I've seen patients that uh, can barely function and, and walk, and then you bring in peptides like thymus and alpha-1, and they all of a sudden inflammation start to go away, and then they start to be functional. They're able to get back into the gym, uh, so that that's probably one of, of my, uh, I would say, favorite uh, peptides of, of all of them, uh, because it is so multifunctional and, and it's so uh, gentle and strong at the same way, yeah, at the same time. Then they have something, it's, it's cousin and times some beta four. Uh, so that one is, is amazing when you have, it's kind of like a, a, a fire that's gone awry when, when the body is just... Uh, so in, inflamed and, and nothing seemed to be working. And uh, then thymus and beta four is, is what, what tends to help to kind of cool that system down. And then I know KPV is, you know, you, you can use that and in that aspect as well to kind of control that inflammation to kind of cool. Uh, Cause a lot of people, they're very symptomatic when they deal with these chronic diseases and, and sometimes the immune system just goes haywire in a response to, an infectious agent. So it's not really an infectious agent that becomes the issue. It's, it's more how the immune system responds to it. So to be able to kind of cool that immune system 
uh, response down becomes a, a very powerful uh, thing to do. So things like times the beta four or you know, KPV becomes comes really uh, good in that area. But then you you have you know for neurological issues, you know like SSR one, uh, one you have a dihexa, you have you know so there, and then for tissue regeneration, you know we would do a lot of the BPC you know one fifty seven. Uh, and that, you know, we can inject that into joints. You can take that orally for gut restoration, for uh, collagen restoration, you know, like you're talking about after uh, dealing with post-Lyme syndrome, you know, what, what to do then, you know, things like thymus and alpha-1, BPC-157 becomes really powerful tools. Uh, and then in regards to cancer, you know, they're, they're, I have three favorite ones, you know, thymus and alpha-1 again. Uh, but also things like methencaphaline and uh, uh, GHK uh, copper, you know, those, those are uh, two powerful ones that help to control a lot of the uh, cancer drivers, you know, because cancer, if, uh, it promotes itself by secreting a number of different chemicals that uh, creates a favorable environment for its existence. So if we can shut down those cancer drivers, and uh, then we are much more successful in, in our uh, in our battle in our journey. So uh, metencaphaline, GHK, uh, copper becomes really good tools along with thymus and alpha one. And GHK copper is also along with the, the BPC and one fifty seven is is really fantastic in regeneration. Uh, it uh, really stimulates the production of stem cells. And uh, in itself, that, that peptide is, is very restorative, anti-inflammatory, and so forth. So uh, it is a, a medicine that I, I feel is, again, these are kind of forefront tools that people aren't really aware of that, they ex that exist. So, and they're dealing with all these chronic issues, and they go to the medical doctor, and they get the same reply, and they get the same anti-inflammatory, same you know, pain medication, same... You know, uh, and they just try to control symptoms rather than utilizing these tools that are available that, that are restorative and regenerative and then put your body in a place where you uh, can deal with these health issues at a, at a much, in a much better place, in a much better way. Yeah, and I love how we can use these peptides to modulate the immune response. To your point, it's not so much the bug that's creating a lot of symptoms, it's our host interaction with those bugs, the immune hypervigilance. And if we can use tools like this to create more tolerance or integration within our microbiome, then a lot of the symptoms that we thought required some bug killing tool, really just required some immunomodulatory approach and peptides can be beautiful in that realm. In our last few minutes together, let's talk about how you might apply some of these tools for specific conditions. So if we think about chronic Lyme, Borrelia, co-infections like Bartonella and Babesia, what are some of the tools either that we talked about already or other tools that would come to mind as primary strategies for dealing with those types of issues? Well, so I, I, I do, I mean, I, I'm a fan just like you and, and detoxification and, and drainage. So I, I, I feel if you don't open up your ability to move junk out, uh, if you start killing, you're just going to be dealing with a, a battlefield with a bunch of corpses you know, that are you know, putrefying and then creating damage within the body. So if you don't have an outlet, you are, are then, you know, you're, you're not going to be in a good place. So with that, you know, things like ionic foot baths, you know, become really important to start with. Uh, laser energetic detox, and it, it depends on how you're using the laser energetic detox. A lot of times you don't want to go after the bugs immediately with it. Uh, you can then support yeah, the removal of chemicals, toxins, etc. And I think a lot of oral agents along with uh, the APM, the emotional aspect, becomes very foundational to, to start with. Uh, and then you know, letting your you know, autonomic response testing, the, the muscle testing we we're talking about, to kind of guide you along in that process. And then as you feel that the individual is strong enough to then be that you start to go after the pathogens, then to then introduce things like like the photodynamic therapy uh, or you know, other intravenous uh, type of substances or uh, using the, the platelet-derived nanomedicine, you know, using those little nanovesicles to kind of offload into areas we, that you need to go after. 
but I, I, the hockey, I, I usually like to kind of introduce that early as well, because I, I just see it just really kind of recharge the individual. Uh, and uh, along with ionic foot bath and laser genetic detox, it, it really kind of moves an individual, you know, faster to where they need to go. So it, it's, uh, uh, that, that's usually where I start. I mean, obviously you, you want to do a lot of the, uh, investigative, uh, which, you know, you have the live blood cell, the, the dry blood cell, and then you can then monitor easily to make sure that you're moving in the right direction with everything that you're doing. So, uh, yeah. I, I love that. And so for chronic Lyme, that was a fantastic kind of potential roadmap. I want to talk a little bit about mold illness. So we know that there's this soup of microbes and toxicants that we encounter in water damaged buildings, that those can be a major player in many chronic conditions, including Lyme disease, even Alzheimer's disease. And so when we think about mold and mycotoxins and this whole soup of bacteria and parasites and everything that we encounter in a water damaged building, what are some of the tools that you think about for mold illness? And then for those people that do consider the possibility of colonization of maybe the sinuses or the gut from long-term exposure to let's say aspergillus in a water damaged building, uh, what are some of the tools that we might consider to also address that colonization aspect of that exposure? Well, I mean, you, you do, you, you, again, you want to start with foundation. Uh, that, that, that is the key. But then when you're dealing with, low, uh, with mold, anytime you start to go after it uh, uh, too much, what happens is that then it secretes all these different chemicals. And then all of a sudden the immune system goes haywire and uh, you, you feel horrible. You got skin rashes. You can't think. You, uh, there, there's all that that comes along with it. So what, what you do want to do is that you want to make sure that you have any way to bind to these chemicals that the, the mold is going to secrete. And there, there are a number of different agents that are available that you can, you can use. I mean, I, I use a lot of the uh, carbon technology type of uh, binders you know, that, that seems to be very good at, at mopping things up and also restorative and also modulatory at the same time. And, and I would strongly suggest using things like KPB or, or uh, thymus and beta-4, thymus and alpha-1, uh, while you're going through that process to control the immune system uh, while, while you're going after it, so to say. Uh, and then things like uh, photodynamic therapy becomes really powerful with the photosensitizer where you can kind of go after the colonizations, like if you have it in your, your sinus cavities, you, know, you you can then introduce riboflavin or methylene blue and then use laser to be able to go after them that way. Uh, and uh, so, and then also then using ozone. I mean, I, I ozone, I, it's, it's in, incredible if done appropriately uh, using then it uh, both rectally and then also doing through, through the ears. If you're dealing with a lot of kind of uh, mind that's impacting your, your, your mind, we have the brain fog and, uh, and the chemicals, you know, from the mold is really impacting it there. Uh, so the, there, there is certain the, the the binders become key because when you bind, then the uh, these chemicals they tend to immobilize the immune system. But when you bind to them, then you the immune system is then more efficiently able to go after the mold. Uh, but then at the same time, you need to then control the immune system so it doesn't become hyperactive. And that's when you use these other tools, you know, like the peptides and so forth. So. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a strategy you have to go through. And it's, a, it's the same thing as with any kind of pathogen. You got to look at the environment. And I'm going to coincidentally guess that the carbons that you use also happen to come from Meridian, Idaho. They, they do. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a Good connections over here. <laughs> so for listeners, I think we're, we're talking here about the microbe formulas, cell core biosciences tools, which I also personally really like and have used and do use on a daily basis for my own ongoing health support. A couple last questions of all the tools that you work with, which ones are exciting you the most at present and really offer the most hope in your mind for improving the lives of those with complex chronic health challenges? I do love PDT. 
I'm, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I, I think that that is a, 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 it's an incredible therapy. And if you combine that and you layer that with other things like peptides, stem cells and uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you know, they, they, they all come together and they work together. But I, I, I think PDT done appropriately, uh, I, I think we can really see tremendous changes in, in people's lives. And, uh, uh, and I have patients coming here, you know, dealing with cancer and then they we have like a two week intensive protocol where, you know, PDT, the photodynamic therapy is, is like the core aspect. And then you, know, you, you layer that with other things like, you know, poly MDA, DCA, curcumin, artisanate, high dose vitamin C, ozone, hyperbaric, and, you know, the detox, you know, with ionic foot bath, laser, energetic detox, the APN. I mean, all these things, they, they come together beautifully, but at the core of it, you know, the, the, the main pillar, uh, I, I feel that the PDT is, is just incredible. And, and combining that also then with uh, the, the nano, you know, the, the platelet derived nano medicine, that's still very, very new. And we're kind of playing around with it and seeing incredible results, but I, uh, the exciting part of that is it's so unexplored. And uh, so that, that is the fun part. You get to explore it and be there when it's happening. I will, in the show notes, put a link to the carlfeltcenter.com. But for people that are interested in learning about your podcast online, your podcast on cancer, your radio show, your TV show, where can they learn more? So the, uh, the podcast, I do a couple of podcasts. One is uh, Integrative Cancer Solution with Dr. Carl Felt, uh, and then Integrative Lyme Solutions with Dr. Carl Felt. And, and the reason for both of them is that uh, these two groups are the ones that seem to be the most frustrated, and they uh, don't seem to have a way out. So uh, my, and my thought is that if they get to listen to people that have been where they are now, and see how they made it through their journey and how they ended up on the other side, that that would give hope and give inspiration and also give insight as to how they can navigate that journey. And, and that is available on both uh, the, the several different platforms, but uh, iTunes, you know, Google Play, uh, I know, Pen, uh, I think Spotify has, I mean, it's a number of different. So you can just type my last name in um, Google and, and then uh, you know, integrative cancer solution or integrative Lyme solution. It should, should pop up that way. Uh, Health made radio is something I've done for a lot of years. And there I get to speak with a, the smartest of the smartest, kind of like what, what you're doing uh, and, and your podcast here, you get to pick people's brain that are uh, just, just incredibly smart in their area. So especially uh, today. <laughs> <laughs> well, some days are exceptions, yeah, but <laughs> no, today is, today is an excellent one. <laughs> well, thank you. But yeah, as a, it, interview people that are just the best of the best, whether they're you know, in physics, you know, like Amit Goswami or uh, Nobel uh, Prize laureates. And I mean, it's, it's just fun. And uh, you can find that on healthmade.co. That's H E A L T H M A D E. Dot co and then you can kind of scroll through and you can see all the different interviews that are, are done there. I uh, also have a TV show called uh, True Health, Body, Mind, Spirit. Uh, it used to be on Amazon Prime, uh, but you can find it on truehealthshow.com. My last question is the same for every guest, and that is what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Uh, I think I just... For me, the, the mental aspect becomes the biggest thing uh, to, to be, have a positive attitude and feel connected. Uh, to me, that is the, the most component and most important component. And then obviously I do a lot of nutritional aspects. You know, I, I, uh, we create our own goat kefir, goat yogurt. Uh, we do uh, a, a lot of gut healing uh, type of uh, foods. We do uh, uh, you know, one of the supplements I'm doing now that I'm really excited about is uh, called the uh, anti-orbital ionic calcium. Yeah, that decalcifies the uh, uh, the cells and, and tissue to turn on mitochondria, and it is, has just tremendous impact on the body in, in so many different ways. And uh, so that, and along then with uh, taking photosensitizer, the methylene blue, I 
I love the thymus and alpha one. I, I do that. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the laser watch. Uh, so all, all these different tools we, we play with continually to make sure that you know, I, I keep on going, doing what I love to do. So you kind of are the Willy Wonka of the chocolate factory with all of these <laughs> wonderful toys and tools and amazing things. This has been such a great conversation. You and I actually only recently got introduced and we've had the opportunity now to speak several times and it's been such a gift and a blessing for me. I really feel your pure heart and your intention to really help people in the work that you do to help minimize their struggle, their suffering. And I just want to thank you so much for everything that you do to honor you and, and to really be grateful for your time in educating all of us. So thank you so much, Dr. Carl Feld. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate this opportunity. And, and I mean, I, I appreciate the work that you do you know, to bring this type of knowledge and all the people that you have to the forefront. I mean, that's, it's a, it's a huge effort and, and I, I recognize the effort that it takes. So thank you as well. To learn more about today's guest, visit the CarlFeltCenter.com. That's the CarlFelt, K A R L F E L D T, Center.com. The CarlFeltCenter.com. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a positive rating or review, as doing so will help the show reach a broader audience. To follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or MeWe, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. To be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. This and other shows can be found on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.